Hello, in this video, we are going to discuss unsolved math problems. That's right, we're going to talk about problems that actually haven't been solved. If you think about it, if you have a math problem that no one can solve, um, so no one can prove it or disprove it, and it's somewhat interesting, it's a pretty big deal. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about those there's a book here I'm going to show you. It's called Unsolved Problems in Number Theory, written by Richard K. Guy. But I thought I would start the video first by actually giving you an unsolved math problem. And if you can figure it out, um, that's awesome, right? So let's, let's write it out. I'm going to write it out in English. Uh, and then if you can solve it, that's awesome. <laughs> so you have to start with a positive number. So start with a positive integer. We're gonna start with the positive integer. Okay, so any positive integer. If it is even, divide it by two. Okay. So if it is even, divide it by two. So for example, if, it, if, you, if the integer is two, you divide it by two and you get one. If the integer is eight, you divide it by two and you get four. If the integer is 36, you divide it by two and you get 18. So you start with the positive integer. If it is even, divide it by two. If it is odd, triple it and add one. And then you will always return to one. So that's the statement. This this is called this is called the Colatz. Hopefully I didn't butcher it. Colatz conjecture. It's going off memory here, but this is a very very powerful uh, conjecture. It's also called I believe the the three n plus one problem. Uh, it's very famous. There's been there's been cash prizes that had been offered uh, for this conjecture. Let, let's just go through it really quick, just so you see. Uh, so you basically have to prove that this is always true. If you can do that, then you've, you've proven a great mathematical uh, <laughs> thing. So like, let's say, let's start, with, um, let's start with two. Should we start with two? Well, two, two, is, uh, two is even, so you divide it by two. Oh, we're at one. By the way, if you start at one, you're already at one, right? Right, but let's let's just say that no, you know, I'm not convinced with that. So one is odd, triple it and add one. So that's going to give you four. If it's even divided by two, that's going to give you two. If it's even divided by two, it's going to give you one. Back at one. Let's start with um, let's start with seven. What happens if you start with seven? Well, if you triple it and you add one, three times seven is twenty-one. All right, uh, and then plus one you get twenty-two, so twenty-two. That's even, so you get 11. Triple it and add one, right? So you're gonna get 33 plus one is 34. Okay, so you got 34. Divide it by two, you're gonna get uh, 17. Triple it and add one, you're gonna get, uh, mm, we picked a big one to start with. Hopefully it's not too bad. <laughs> so you're gonna get uh, three times that 52. Because right, you get 51 plus, and then divide it by two. You get 26, divide it by 2, you get 13. Triple it and add 1, you're going to get 40. All right, you're going to get 40. Divide it by 2, you get 20. Divide it by 2, you get 10. All right, you get 10. Uh, divide it by 2, you get 5. Triple it and add 1, so 15 plus 1 is 16. Divide it by 2, you get 8. Divide it by 2, you get 4. 4 divided by 2, you get 2 divided by 2, you get 1. We're back at 1. But that doesn't prove it, right? You have to show that it's actually true for it, – al it always works. So if you can do that, you've proven the Colette's conjecture. Hopefully I didn't butcher that. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea with the Colette's conjecture. So pretty powerful stuff. So that's an easy unsolved problem to understand. The ones in this book uh, do require more mathematics to understand. So they're not quite as – easy to understand as the Colatz conjecture. That's one of the things I think that makes this one so interesting is that it's so easy to understand in some sense. 
So this book contains discussions of hundreds of open questions organized into 178 different topics, right? And it's just different, different pieces of number theory. Let's open it up. And it's dedicated to uh, Paul Erdos, for Erdos Paul. Paul Erdos was a famous uh, Hungarian mathematician. Um, he's a very interesting, he was a very interesting character. Uh, he's very uh, eccentric, very strange, very uh, not uh, like other people, right? So they say he would travel from um, school to school. From, you know, he, would, he would show up and say, my mind is open and all he had was like a suitcase. And there's all these stories uh, about Erdos. He produced a lot of serious mathematics. And so it's no wonder um, that Richard K. Guy has uh, dedicated the book to him. Let's see what else he says here about it. Let's take a moment to look. Among his several greatnesses are an ability to ask the right question and to ask it of the right person. All right, interesting. So he knows who to ask. Let's see what this says here. To many laymen, mathematicians appear to be problem solvers, people who do hard sums. Yeah, even inside the profession, we classify ourselves as either theorists or problem solvers. Mathematics is kept alive much more than by the activities of either class, by the appearance of a succession of unsolved problems, hardcore, right? Both from within mathematics itself and from the increasing number of disciplines where it is applied. Mathematics often owes more to those who ask questions than to those who answer them. The solution of a problem may stifle interest in an area around it, but for Matt's last theorem, because it is not yet a theorem, has generated a great deal of good mathematics, whether goodness is judged by beauty, by death, or by applicability. What's the copyright on this? Okay, so this is an older book, 81. Right, because he's talking about, uh, for Matt's last theorem, not being a theorem. To pose good unsolved problems is a difficult art. The balance between triviality and hopeless unsolvability is delicate. Yes. Yeah, uh, I had this uh, I had this professor. He, he, he passed away. And he, he said the same thing. He would say that um, if a problem in mathematics is, is just too hard, so that's what he's talking about here, just hopeless unsolvability. No one is going to, you know, you can't, you're not going to focus on it because you're thinking like, there's no way I'm going to solve it, right? So, so you want something that where you feel like you, you think you can make some progress. Um, there are many simply stated statements which experts tell us are unlikely to be solved in the next generation. But we have seen the four color conjectures settled, even if we don't live long enough to learn the status of the Riemann and Goldbach hypotheses of twin primes or machine primes or of odd perfect numbers. On the other hand, unsolved problems may not be unsolved at all or may be much more tractable than was at first thought. What's this say? Among the many contributions made by the Hungarian mathematician uh, Erdos Paul, not least is the steady flow of well-posed problems. Yeah, he's got um, – I have books that have proofs written by Paul Erdos. As if these were not incentive enough, he offers rewards for the first solution of many of them. At the same time, giving his estimate of a difficulty, he has made many payments from $1 to $1,000. <laughs> so he went around paying people to solve problems. One purpose of this book is to provide beginning researchers and others who are more mature, but isolated from adequate mathematical stimulus with a supply of easily understood, if not easily solved, problems which they can consider in varying... Let's come up here so you can see it. Depth. And by making occasional partial progress, gradually acquire the interest, confidence, and persistence that are essential to successful research. Yeah, so let's let's take a look at you know the inside of this book so we can see what it actually contains. So it's got a glossary of symbols. Okay, there's there's not that many books on unsolved problems. That's one of the reasons that this is quite an interesting book. And then here you have um, the contents. Here the contents of this this book. I'll try to find this book, by the way. If I can find it, I'll leave a, I'll leave a link in the description. Additive number theory. Wow, right? Sequences of integers. I mean, just tons of, tons of topics here. None of the above. And here's the introduction. Look at all of the references here. This is funny. Look at this. So let, let's read this first, and I'm going to show you something really funny. 
Uh, number theory has fascinated both the amateur and the professional for a longer time than any other branch of mathematics, so that much of it is now of considerable technical difficulty. However, there are more unsolved problems than ever before, and though many of these are unlikely to be solved in the next generation, this probably won't deter people from trying. They are so numerous that they have already filled more than one volume, so that the present book is just a personal sample. Erdoff recalls that Landau, at the International Cong Congress in Cambridge in 1912, gave a talk about primes and mentioned four problems, which were unattackable in the present state of science, and says that in 1980 they still are. Here are some good sources of problems in number theory. And then look, Paul Erdos, Paul Erdos, Paul Erdos, Paul Erdos. It's ridiculous, right? This is just all Paul Erdos, right? I mean, legendary, right? So much mathematics that this man produced. It is just astounding to me. Uh, and let's turn the page here. And here's more. Look at this. Paul Erdos, Paul Erdos, Paul Erdos. Okay, there's some other people there finally. All right, Serpinski, Ulam, all right. So, but yeah, yeah, crazy. So prime numbers, this is A, prime numbers. We can partition the positive integers into three classes, that he, uh, he says here. The unit, which is one, the primes, the composite numbers. And then he just goes on, gives some definitions. A number greater than one is prime if its only positive dividers are one and itself. Otherwise, it is composite. Yeah, and, and most people, this is really basic stuff that you learn. Here they're talking about greatest common divisor, co-prime, um, Dirichlet's theorem. And then here's a question. Now, are there infinite many primes of the form a squared plus one? Probably so. And then... Here's another one. Are there infinitely many primes of the form n factorial plus 1? So the only values of n uh, less than or equal to 230 which give primes are these. It is not known if n factorial minus 1 or this uh, expression here uh, is prime infinitely often. Wow. Yeah, so lots of problems. In number three, and that's pretty much the whole book. You just get problem and problem and problem. So a little more, a little more advanced than um, the example I gave you uh, at the beginning of this video. But uh, this, I think, this would be a good book for someone who knows number three already and is looking for some, you know, harder stuff. But definitely not, uh, you know, uh, something you should get if you're like you're trying to like you know learn number three, intro to the subject. But if you if you're into number theory, uh, certainly. Oh, it smells really good. Certainly uh, a unique, a, a unique take. So yeah. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Uh, hopefully you understood uh, this problem here. Uh, what, do, what do you think about this? I'm curious. Um, have you seen this before? Have you never seen it? And um, yeah, it's an unsolved, unsolved problem. Funny story. I just remembered this. I, uh, I would often do this in my Calc 2 class. We had a worksheet that we, do, we would do in class after the lecture. And the very last question, I think it was like number three, was was this question, but I would write it down uh, as a sequence. Um, and they basically had to show something, right? They, I, I basically asked them to prove the Colette's conjecture. And so everyone's working on it. I was like, how, how do you show them? And then I, after a couple minutes, you know, w once I see people struggling with it, I would, uh, you know, I'd let them know, hey, it's an unsolved problem, you know, after, I don't, you know, I don't want people to spend two hours on, on an unsolved problem. Um, but... Yeah, kind of a fun thing, kind of a fun thing to realize that uh, you're, you're sitting in class and you're working on an unsolved problem. So there it is, the Colette's conjecture, one of the, probably one of the easiest unsolved problems uh, uh, that can be uh, explained in, um, you know, in simple terms like this. So yeah, if you found any value in this content, feel free to hit subscribe if you want to. I have another channel, it's called The Internet Sorcerer, where I post random stuff. And I have math courses on tons of math subjects, algebra, calculus, differential equations, abstract algebra, advanced calculus. They're on Udemy, but if you get them, please use my links uh, from either my videos or from my website, mathsorcer.com. Until next time, keep doing mathematics.